Welcome everyone to the Green Economic Recovery and its impact on the Energy Transformation Agenda panel. I would like to introduce our speakers. First off, Dr. Rabia Farouki, uh, Director of Knowledge, Policy and Finance from IRENA. Welcome. Mr. Christian Jaramillo, the Director General of UPME. Welcome. Uh, um, Madam Angela Cadena, the Coordinator of the Mission de Transformación. Um, Mr. Adrian Dugulan, the head of business development for Columbia for NL Green Power. And I'd like to, uh, yeah, and welcome back to our two co-moderators, Mr. Ramon Fiestas of GEWEC and Herman Corredor of SER. I'll hand it off to you, Ramon. That we are going to have a very exciting um, discussion and debate uh, about the issue of green recovery and the mission of transformation in, in Colombia. I would like to invite, first of all, to our special guest, um, Dr. Rabia Faruqi, uh, in order to, to hear about his uh, keynote speech. Uh, please, Ms. Rabia, you can go ahead. Um, uh, again, thank you, Ramon, for the introduction. Uh, thank you very much uh, to GWEC and Ser Colombia for, for inviting me today. It's a pleasure to be here with you, especially that we have really forged uh, uh, ties uh, uh, with Colombia based on uh, a lot of uh, our activities, uh, including Arena Coalition for Action, of which GWEC and Ser are a member as well as ARENA's more recent work on renewable energy auctions, which we've done in close collaboration with the government of Colombia. So obviously at a time of, of unprecedented recovery and, and stimulus plans, we have a unique opportunity to, to invest in a climate safe future uh, uh, and to guide governments in this work. ARENA has put forward a post recovery agenda uh, for resilience, development and equality that links the short-term measures uh, with long-term development climate objectives. We can send you in the chat, we can send you the, the link to the report. I'll be very, uh, 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 try to be very brief on that and then go more precisely to the work that we've done with Colombia. Uh, under the scenario that IRENA has, which is the IRENA transforming energy scenario, uh, uh, the share of renewables in global power generation would increase significantly uh, from around 25% to uh, 57% by 2030. Wind energy, both onshore and offshore, will play a significant role and become the largest generating uh, source of electricity from a share of about 6% today uh, uh, to about 21% in 2030. And for our 2050 scenario, this would be even bigger. So it would move from 2,500 gigawatts in 2030 to, 2000, to, to about 6,000 uh, in 2050, sorry. Now, of course, an energy transition of the kind in line with this IRENA scenario would require significant uh, investments, uh, not only in renewables, but uh, broad, more broadly in the energy system, including energy efficiency and infrastructure. Next, please. While these investments are significant, one element that we always showcase is the fact that these investments can bring massive socioeconomic benefits, both in the short and long term. And we estimate uh, through our modeling exercise, the impact on GDP growth, on employment gains, and broad welfare contribution. So if you see on the slide overall, we would need investments of about 4.5 billion annual um, for, for the energy transition. This includes for onshore and offshore investments, 340 billion annually. Uh, this would generate an additional 19 million jobs in renewables, energy efficiency, and energy system flexibility over the next decade. It would also boost GDP by 1.3% per year compared to a business as usual scenario. So important to note uh, in a COVID-19 context is that these benefits start to occur already in the first few years of uh, an increased investment in renewables and could really help kickstart uh, the, the, the global economy. As you can see also in this graph, all regions 
uh, in the world stand to gain from this transition, uh, with some, of course, bearing, uh, faring better than others, depending on country conditions, resources, ambition, etc. If we just look at wind energy jobs uh, by 2030, next slide, please. In absolute terms, you see that renewable energy job would reach 30 million by 2030, tripling the number today. This is true also of wind energy job, which would triple from today 1.2 million to around 3.7 million job by 2030. Just to put it into context, the whole energy sector globally has about 58 million jobs. So, you know, the, 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 the current uh, uh, jobs numbers today in renewables is about 11.8 million so which means that this is a, 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 a large share of, of jobs in the energy sector overall. Next slide, slide, please. So as mentioned, countries have different resources, different strengths, different ambitions, different conditions, economic and social. But an important uh, part of the work that we do in ARENA is to support, support countries in determining where and how local value can be leveraged. Uh, in doing so, IRENA assesses the number of, uh, not only the number, but also the types of jobs created along the segments of the value chain, as well as the materials and the equipment needed in each of these segments. So if you look uh, in the onshore wind uh, value chain, for example, 43% is uh, our human resources required for uh, operation and maintenance, 30% in installation and grid connection, Manufacturing and procurement employs 17% of the total. And what is interesting is that the majority of labor uh, are construction uh, workers and technicians, which means that uh, relatively low-skilled labor, which can be very e uh, more easily, let's say, transferred from conventional uh, energy employment towards uh, renewables. Based on local context, we find that renewables are really uniquely positioned to generate benefits along the, the different segments of the value chain and accelerate local value creation. And this is, we have the same for, 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 for solar and other technologies. Next, please. Now to maximize these benefits, we need to make sure that we have a holistic uh, policy framework in place. This means that effective deployment policies such as renewable auctions, that, which I will talk about in a minute, must go hand in hand with energy, uh, uh, the, the, uh, with energy um, uh, system integration policies and, and broader enabling policies that include ambitious targets, of course, but industrial policies to strengthen, strengthen the local industry and value chains, labor market policies, social protection policies, in this, in this transition to address this, the misalignments that are bound to happen in any structural change of the, of the economy or the energy sector. Next, please. So, as I said, it, I will very briefly focus on one deployment policies because we've done some nice work with Colombia, uh, uh, which, is, which are auctions. Uh, ARENA's auctions framework is divided into four categories. Uh, uh, one is auction demand, two qualification requirements, three winner selection criteria, and four, as you see in the graph, risk allocation. So we've used this framework uh, to analyze two auctions in Colombia that took place in 2019 uh, based on the request of uh, the Colombian uh, Ministry of Mines and Energy, which we finished very recently. And given that the first auction in February 2019 did not award contracts, we focus on the modifications made to all four design categories that allowed the second auctions in October 2019 to be more successful. Next, please. So if you look at, uh, uh, at uh, what happens in the second auction, uh, uh, at about US $28 per megawatt hour, Colombia's weighted average price were significant significantly lower than the global or regional average in 2018. Uh, and I, a, combi a combination of factors have driven these prices. One is country-specific conditions, such as resource availability, which is very high in Colombia. Uh, La uh, Guajira region, home to all six awarded wind projects, has one of the highest wind speeds in the world. 
Second is the high uh, degree of investors' confidence that the country has enjoyed. Uh, third are other policies supporting renewable energy sector as a whole, including fiscal and financial instruments that have been implemented. Uh, finally, the way uh, auctions are designed from the onset is extremely important and can be done in a way to achieve low prices, as well as other goals, depending on the country's prior priorities and, and, and broader uh, objectives. Next, please. So, uh, indeed, some auction design elements could be revisited to account for the multiple objectives that the country might have, including Colombia. Increasing ambition and, and, and committing to a long-term schedule would increase investors' confidence and, and attract a, a larger number of bidders. Uh, beyond comp competition, auctions can offer the potential to foster the development of local industries and create jobs by engaging communities as well. La Guajira region, for example, has been historically marginalized and energy poor. Auctions may be designed in a way to attract um, uh, projects uh, into the region and, and, and spur economic uh, activity and, and, and create even more jobs. Uh, auction can obviously also be designed to be more inclusive towards small and, and, and new players uh, by establishing uh, winner selection criteria that can compensate bidders beyond uh, their pricing offer. Uh, next and final slide, please. Um, in addition to the work I, I just uh, 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 briefly uh, presented, I would like to bring your attention uh, to the ARENA Coalition for uh, Action, which is a multi-stakeholder platform uh, that gathers over 100 leading renewable energy players, including uh, uh, industry association, private sector companies, civil society, and others. Uh, the coalition's uh, business and investors uh, group uh, is co-chaired by GWEC together with Solar Power Europe and works to scale up renewable energy investment. The group has identified Colombia as a country of particular interest for investment and therefore uh, recently uh, put forward a joint position paper outlining from an industry point of view uh, what is needed to ensure a rapid scale-up of private sector investment. So I, I highly recommend all of you to have a look at the paper and would like to thank again GWEC, Ser Colombia and Siemens Gamesa uh, and of course other coalition mem members for their great contribution to that work. Thank you again for inviting me and I look really forward to our continued collaboration with Colombia. Thank you very much. Many, many, many thanks, Rabia, for your joining us this morning at Columbia Wind Power and for your presentation. We really appreciate the effort of IRENA to scale up renewable energy investment in Colombia. As you know very well, the global wind industry is setting its efforts in this market at the Business and Investors Group in the Coalition for Action of IRENA. Unfortunately, I understand you have to leave us now, but before continuing the discussion with our other panelists, let me ask you about one of the main findings and recommendation of this working group that is about to enhance clarity on renewable energy plans beyond 2022 in Colombia. So according to Irina's experience, uh, Dr. Rabia, why are long-term country-driven strategies and energy planning so critical in the pathways of uh, to per the performance of the climate goals. Can you give us your insights? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I, thank you for the question. It's a very good question, and uh, obviously, long-term plan planning and uh, integrated resource planning is essential uh, for uh, preparing the energy transition. Um, those pathways are a, 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 a break of, of, uh, from the past. So we have to look, sort of leave what, what, is, what we're used to and uh, that comfort zone and go into a new energy system. 
And that requires, of course, technology policies uh, that are specific to the renewable energy sector, the energy efficiency sector, but they, this must go hand in hand with, uh, 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 with ambition, uh, as I mentioned earlier, with leveling the playing field and not give uh, uh, conventional energy sources uh, a, a, a cost competitive advantage, uh, the removal of subsidies uh, for certain countries, certain instruments that need to be introduced that are like carbon pricing. But uh, more than that, I think the systemic changes that are required from a social and economic point of view are, are really major. So you have major, ma major structural uh, 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 breakdowns or, 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 uh, or alignments rather that have to be made in order to prepare that transition. This is why I mentioned what you can do along the segments of the value chain for renewables in order to make sure that you localize some of the value for domestic uh, uh, growth uh, of GDP, uh, of growth in, in, in uh, jobs, uh, which ultimately goes to welfare. So I think the main idea around long-term planning, and this is what we have been doing over the past few years in ARENA, is look at the energy transition from a technology point of view, but not isolate the, the planning uh, of that energy transition to uh, technology uh, uh, to, to, the, to, to technology options only, but make sure that the that technology pathway uh, and the energy system pathway is really um, uh, uh, very much interlinked with the socioeconomic structure it it is it is built upon. And only if you look at these interlinkages can you estimate uh, the, the potential for, uh, for growth, economic growth, for, for job creation and, and welfare. So all in all, I think only a holistic framework, policy framework, uh, is, uh, is, um, is uh, what, we, what, we, what needs to be, um, to be tackled when looking at long-term planning uh, and its success, basically. <clears throat> Many thanks, Rabia. Um, that was a very interesting presentation and, and a follow-up question as well. Um, without further ado, um, I'm going to pass it on to uh, Herman Corredor to pick up. Radio for just... It is very interesting to hear more about this development of wind power projects all over the world with the creation of jobs and the different financial benefits that we can get out of that. So it is important to really start thinking about how this works in this Colombian reality. Of course, this could lead to a very good, valid analysis, but we have our own particular challenges. So why don't we focus on that? So first and foremost, we were talking about a new auction that was coming. We believe that that was very interesting as well. We believe that the government is now believing that these non-conventional renewable energies are going to be key for us to be able to strengthen this financial cooperation, and that is going to be the foundation for us to start a new, a new uh, tender. So, from Ugme, Christian, what do you think about the role of electric power energy in this point of just really having this economic? recovery and what is the predictability in the long and short terms for and medium terms for us to be able to have this eolic or wind power projects and for us to be able to develop this since we know that there is a very important point of terms of this phase two projects that we have and how this is going to be just developed and what are we thinking let's say how are we going to get this financial benefits that are not only in terms of investment, but also in terms of the things that we're going to do. Are we going to actually create jobs and how are we going to have this type of development related to Colombia? Christian, tell us a little bit more about what do you think? Thank you, Herman. Greetings to all of those that are joining us today. There are several questions at the same time, but it will depend on the different projects are on the way. 
There are projects where we already assign responsibilities, mainly large-scale projects, beyond the type and the difficulties that they might have faced during the pandemic, where we hope that those projects will continue with their schedule uh, to normal construction. We don't believe that we would have important delays. So, especially those large projects that are on the way because of the commitments with the system, we are not seeing delays of any kind. It will continue in course as scheduled. The line that must be ready for in order for those projects to be connected, well, uh, we had already anticipated some of the difficulties that we have faced, like uh, communities having this kind of, so to say, uh, social license. But that is a part of what we will have to negotiate and solve. But once again, there is not something that we had not yet considered. Uh, here I have some numbers, 19 projects with approved connection, around 2,500 megawatts, uh, around 2,000 megawatts have this commitments that we are discussing. Um, we also have demands. And there, we hope to start, but additional requests at the Guajira mainly, almost 7,000 in Guajira and the rest of the Atlantic. But Atlantic of Bolivar is another coastal area in, in the interior of the country. And we are preparing in order to create a second line of transmission at the Guajira in the most appropriate way uh, or location possible to have non commercial large-scale uh, energy. So, now I would like to tell you about an, a specific item about uh, the Colombian reality about connections. We have a bet on smaller scale. Those are projects that have 20 megabytes and lower. We also see an important potential growth there, but it is much more difficult to figure out how we will be uh, creating it and make it a reality. What is the obstacle in this expansion of the one that has a commitment with the system, but the other one that is much more spread apart? In the way that we have been allocating this in the country, we face that many of the projects obtain the permit to connect to the system. Others haven't, and they, we don't have a date when they will be doing so. And there are others that are asking for more connection. So we have a capacity, it has been allocated, but it has not been well controlled, and we have been having people asking for more capability. Ability. So we need to figure out which ones are, will be connected and which one won't, and that, that capacity that will not be used be assigned to others. So the government issued a resolution recently stating that whenever somebody will not be using a connection, he will have to turn it over to somebody else so we can have a sense of what is going to be ex operated not. So that will enable us to build lower capacity projects uh, relatively in a short time. For us, speeding up construction is without overloading the line. For renewables, we need to have a recovery at a midterm. And right now, we are strongly working that physical barriers for the connection, those are barriers that have been created by regulations, be solved. So there's one side that's shorter term that will, it is important to keep in mind energy efficiency. 
we have a role as ume, UPME to have energy efficiency. And we will be updating which are the lines that benefit from tax incentives, benefits, and other types of benefits. And CER can also participate there. We can also open to other sectors in the industry the possibility of uh, helping in that recovery on non-convectional renewables. ProURE, we hope to have a new version by uh, next year. I would like to ask Adrian now, as a representative of a company that is undertaking projects that are about to start construction in the Guajira wind projects. How can you take advantage or what is your opinion or how will you be undertaking construction uh, that industrial capacity? How can we promote the industry to be more involved on wind projects in the Guajira. Adrián, could you give us a perspective? Please tell us how you are considering that topic. Thank you, Herman. Hi, and good morning to all of you uh, that are joining us at this moment in time. Yes, it's very important on local energy, as it has been mentioned, Previously, most of the projects are having developed in the Guajira, an area that needs this type of development that will be helping people and it will also be a bridge for job creation. So, um, labor, we are trying to uh, use local labor, provide the opportunity of the local people uh, to be higher, we are always looking uh, for local companies that to make uh, the Colombian industry participate and link them to other projects. We are also working in other countries, in Chile, Brazil, and other places worldwide. We will be bringing that in experience and we will be uh, training them on our design so uh, Colombian companies can participate in the sector and will be contributing to the construction of these uh, projects. However, since we are just starting all this entire movement towards renewables, at a larger scale that is starting just to be constructed and according to the bids that are being prepared for next year, that is a sign that is a sector that will continue to develop. This is giving us a certainty about the future so local companies can invest in order to be aligned to the requirements that this industry requires. Angela Cadena is coordinator of the Mission of the Transformación Energética that uh, ended this year. Uh, so she can talk to us about the outcome of the analysis of the mission of the market was not approaching that much renewables but um, charges per reliability or multinodal, but not that much on renewables. However, knowing that Angela is an expert in our sector and knows pretty well our sector, I would like to have her opinion on how, departing that from the first bid, there was no element that will provide incentives to participate as national industry, and if COVID did do so, it is on, uh, in the understanding that is an opportunity but not an incentive. 
how do you see the real possibility to include the industry beyond superficial topics and that we can really make progress with renewable energies. How? What's your opinion on that? Hi, good morning to all of you. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Herman. Well, I want to say three things. First, under the assumption that at the long term, the national industry will bring more benefits than the cost at a short term. I will do this analysis. I will provide you with my opinions. Secondly, I want to say that everybody has it clear, but it will be nice to point it out, that the world is moving to creating electricity, that electricity, a great percentage of it, will be generated with renewable energies. It is obvious where that in countries carbon is more used, but and decarbonization is much more difficult to obtain. But I think that our country, Colombia has moved, has be, it has been said here, is looking to increase renewables at a larger scale, having more possibilities to that participation. In Colombia, we see a movement to incorporate renewables in a centralized way and decentralized way. And the mission looked at the enablers, what will be their share in participating in the wholesale on the grid that has to be with the distribution and demand of the service. That would be the second. And before, in that higher participation of demand in order to comply with electrification, open spaces. We need to link, get, offer, demand, grid, so it is key. I think that the government has considered it and has set it as an, a strategic point at this moment in time. So to answer to your question, in addition to all this, we are not on the same scenario that we were one year ago. We are in a completely different scenario. And there are some questions that we had for last year and how to include more participation of the industry. Those are challenges that are still existing. but. To my opinion, uh, nowadays they become much more important. So uh, it is an energy dilemma. And it should be thought as a three sides dilemma. It has the challenges of redoing. Emissions? greenhouse effect emissions, and then we are internalizing benefits to include the citizenry with energy supplies throughout infrastructure. So what is missing is the reactivation of economy that was important before, but it's much more important now. The creation of value should be stated as an objective that will help to make decisions on energy policies. And the other acts of the Pentagon, I have not done that pretty well. I had several opportunities during the classes, but we need to democratize but it is not yet clear to me if the access we will be covering it. So I think that we have four dilemmas there. And well, 
we need to share value, and that becomes critical. Christian is saying we are speeding up. Yes, the country has decided to accelerate what they used to do, create jobs, infrastructure works, particularly the ones on renewables. And according to the search I did yesterday, there is not in Colombia, and there is a graph about it um, dated on 2017, large elements where we can incorporate jobs, particularly in construction, much less on operation. So I hope that we could also be involved in the supply and planning and logistics. So that will be an objective of energy policy. That is not obvious when you have a purpose of guaranteeing minimum cost energy. But I do believe that under this condition, that should be on the table. So the participation of national industry should be a purpose. And that requires to anticipate in the project's requirements so the industry can be prepared. We don't have the scale to supply short term. We saw that with oil, but I think that we should be considering and anticipate. I think that we need to cover energy disaggregation on classes. So if participation of the industry becomes a reality, that industry knows about the requirements to participate. That not, it not only involves the government, but also the sector how projects are being managed, which are each of the elements that uh, integrated, and which are the different supplies for renewables. So I think that we should have accompanied, and that should be a purpose of energy reform at this moment in time, not only make it more efficient as energy, but do things that we have not done so far, and do it in a better way in order to improve energy development. And so I think that this dilemma will be fourfold instead of threefolds. And um, I hope that the benefit at a long run and the income at a long run will be higher, the additional cost that we would have, and the benefit for society, the benefit cost for society would be uh, one. Uh, thank you, Angela. That is quite interesting. And now I would like to ask Christian, obviously, at a long term, uh, renewable energies at a middle and long term will be present, and certainly there will be new projects. Undoubtedly, that is the scenario that we have before us. According to the registration of uh, projects, but on the planning side in order to include these renewable energies on the mix. What is changing? What are you thinking in changing on the approaches and requirements as UPME? Thank you, Herman. Well, here, in order to answer, I will give you a context and maybe link it to what Angela was saying in extending the objectives of energy policy, particularly the proposal of Angela to promote local industry within the scope of the energy policy. But we must be very careful because it does make sense but there are different areas in the state that promote those type of activities and intend that energy policy would be created according to local industry would be maybe having the risk of not being able to achieve it with local industry. So what are the difficulties that the that we have uh, in planning, and those are some things that we need to improve. I think that on the practice, in order to improve it, we'll be improving on the non-conventional renewables. It's not because I want them, but 
The first thing is that we are living very clearly, and it is a problem of all this linear structure in the country, is that we have shown as very little successful on social license management. So planning as the first measure, we have to react. It is a short-term measure, and we need to admit a short-term and we have to take a little bit more of, of distance, but I will have more uncertainty. My projections will be more uncertain. And if I am planning much more ahead, the world will be less predictable. And that has a consequence, obviously. In Colombia, expansion, a large scale expansion on generation plan was the one that led to the expansion of the grid. So you went out to a bid on reliability uh, where you will be assigning the plans in order to include the to the grid. If I'm going to be doing a planning ahead 12 years after to have the necessary space, it will be no longer possible to know which are the plants that will be installed. And if I don't know which plants will be expand, the expansion of the grid at a certain moment in time will be a bit. I bet that maybe in the future there will be a great potential of plants, but just think that not only talking about CGRE, but I think that I have to see the locations where there's a potential and I have to see to the north, to the Guajira, and other places, other locations, and it will be modified not as a main objective, but as a collateral, favoring the penetration of wind and solar on the grid. That is acknowledging at a short term of a failure of managing social licensing. But a larger one, and where we should be a very attentive, the great challenge of planning I would say not even of planning of the planner and the governments to find the way to have a better way to obtain that social license it's to reduce the distance and generally trying to talk to the system. What so what Angela was saying fits in here. All the large centers that are going to be made decarbonization electrification as a way of decarbonizing. All these changes to a great extent are being um, aligned to climate change. And climate change will be costly, not only initial investment that you need to do, but on the path there will be things that will be more costly than others because we need to take into account their impact on the environment. There will be those that will benefit, but those that benefit will always be the same. So uh, we see a great distance ahead with beneficiaries and, peop and costs that are different and that are unpredictable. And uh, planning to that distance, what is, the plan is not longer that important, but the possibility of changing the course throughout time that will enable us to negotiate with a population uh, and make all those changes within time. So what do we have right now in addition to the short term to be planning ahead on a longer term that we will be capable to convey the population, persuade the population, create a language where we obtain that social licensing and I think that we have to do much better in the sector. We have to see the capability of using the location to have the lines that we don't have nowadays. Because it happens because we need to create a new language that will not be a technical wall used by engineers and that we can talk to people about what they care, their jobs, their income, the environment where they live. So I believe that that is a huge challenge for us. Thank you, Krista. Uh, just one minute because we are running out of time. Tell us what is the potential after hearing this experience 
of what is being executed in the Guajira and to the future, the possibility of new projects, not only in the Guajira, but also in the country. How do you see and how are you analyzing these possibilities? I will try to be very brief, although I know this is a subject that is very important. It's quite broad. If we think about this, I believe that there's huge possibility, there's a huge potential, as Dr. Jaramillo was addressing in the Guajira region, and we may have many more possibilities in that regard. So what we have to do right now at this time, we as companies, but also as a state, we need to start just really just start to comply with everything that all stakeholders are telling us, stakeholders who are just welcoming us in their territories because we have been working in Guajira in consideration of all of the complexities and all communities. So I think that right now the most important part would be to start just really continue with all of this, let's say, meetings that we're trying to get for you with the companies and with the, the authorities as well. And also it is very clear to us that since we have in the medium and short term, well, we have the possibility of just diversifying this other regions in the Atlantic shore for us to be able to get into all of these wind power projects. And how is the world going to be like after this pandemic? That's very important. We also need to learn a little bit more. We need to take all of this in, into consideration and where we can just continue working, let's say, through some sort of, let's say, momentum that we have, but well, all of this is mainly framed in this year 2020 where we have COVID and we can just start thinking about how can we really just provide more support in this, let's say, energy transformation in Colombia. Thank you so much, Adrian. Angela, I believe that she has left the room, maybe, or are you here, Angela? Otherwise, I would just like to thank Angela, Adrian, Christian for just really sharing very interesting points of view. I think that all of this is going to lead to a very interesting point of discussion and we are going to just start just really reviewing planning and we're going to broaden everything that we have as part of this and also knowing that we have some possibilities of industrial integration. I feel that we still have, let's say, more ways for us to start just doing all of this. We need to take all of these possibilities, but it is important that we can start just integrating different types of policies for us to be able to harvest and just really have all of this positive impact the best way possible. Thank you so much. Everyone, this was very interesting. And that well, we will continue with this event. That was very interesting. Thank you so much. Renewable energy for sustainable development, sustainable energy, and decarbon decarbonized energy for everyone's for innovation and value shared in every project. Wind power projects in Colombia. Wind Peshi to Mawin and Chemeski, located in La Guajira, are going to add up to 505 megawatts of install capacity and may reach 2,340 gigawatts per year for 20 years. Welcome to a greener world. The, the next session where we're going to have to migrate over to the sessions area of the Hopin platform for a technical breakout session from Vortex. But first, uh, we'll have a, a message from our silver sponsor, NL Green Power. And I would like to just um, remind everyone that the um, networking and virtual expo functions are still live and available at all times. Now for a message from EGP. Thank you.